What is this? Uh, cool. So this is my my hobby, almost turns turning it into uh, well, someday day job ish stuff. Um, so my uh, my special skill is doing software test automation, and uh, I had this crazy idea to kind of take it out of the computer, put it into a robot, uh, and kind of the uh, the the acid test is to see if I can create a robot that can play Angry Birds. Um, so I did it. I got it working just yesterday. Actually presented this at the Jenkins Conf. Um, here in San Francisco and uh, got it all working. So I could show you a demo of it working if you want. Before we get to the demo, I want to talk a little bit about what this thing is. What's its name? So this is called the Bitbeam Bot. Uh, I don't think that's my f the final name for it, but that's the best thing I can come up with. Um, it actually started from a different project, like an art project that I've been working on for the last couple of years, and that's called Pin Thing. Uh, and if you imagine, you know those pin screen devices or like pin art you can kind of put your face in it your hands uh, and so this is, this is I made this mechanism for the pin art display if you, basically the idea is to make it like pin art and to motorize every single one of those pin and have a computer controlled you make like a 3D an actual 3D so this has been like my ongoing hobby art project thing um, and I finally got the mechanism I prototyped it in Lego a couple months ago finally had it and uh, frustrating thing about hobbies is like well it's a hobby no day job thing related. And then I realized as I was playing around with this thing and holding it, if I turn it upside down, potentially it could be something that can kind of click things. And I realized, oh, wait a second, well, Selenium and my day job writing test frameworks that can click on buttons. Um, it really kind of started with this little mechanism, and this robot kind of was really built around uh, you know, the second kind of a later prototype of this. Uh, and so I have this harness that's now powered with a stepper motor. and. Uh, Classic kind of CNC machine design to uh, to make to get to any kind of point in 3D space, and um, so now I've got my little clicker built the rest of the robots, um, and this kind of gets it out of Hobbyland into potentially something that could be useful to people. Like when you have a new device that comes out on the market, um, like some mobile device, and you kind of want to play around with it. Um, I I could I mean right now this is the first prototype ever. It's kind of silly, but um, I could see future versions of this incredibly being. Uh, something that people could use for, for test automation. And mobile is a huge thing, and I, so this could potentially be useful. And, and if it's never useful, it's still kind of cool and fun to work on. So you were just trying to do something as a side project. Right. And then you sort of had a, a moment of eureka, and yeah. you said, wait, this is, this is actually related to the bigger idea I've been working on for years. Well, there's t well two things. Um, the first eureka was I made this prototype out of Lego, and then I and then I, I was going to port it to you know it's time for me to grow up, get it out of Lego into real materials, and that was really frustrating. And so I had one moment where I remembered seeing actually I learned about this thing called uh, Gridbeam at the Maker Fair in uh, in the Bay Area, 2010. Met the Gridbeam guys, Richard Jurgensen, I think, and he told me about the Gridbeam project. And um, so I had the book, got it, and then. When I had this prototype, I, re I remembered that project, picked up the book again, and basically ported my design to Gridbeam. But so I created Bitbeam, which is a miniaturized version of Gridbeam. Uh, so that was like the first thing is like I can actually can make my own Lego. So I got a membership at Tech Shop San Francisco, and I've been laser cutting my own little Lego compatible Lego Technic compatible beam. So that was kind of one moment. Um, and then the second thing was when I built this little contraption, still thinking this is just for my art project that. Um, if I turn it upside down, potentially make it something that actually can send a click to a device, this potentially is something that I could use at work to kind of show off what we do. You know, at work we do this cloud computing thing, but it's very uh, abstract. And it's in the cloud and it's invisible. Um, but this can really actually show off all the things that we do, cloud computing for, for test labs, but it's a lot more tangible of a thing that we can talk about. So it's still, so it's still testing. But it's something we can kind of look at and say, oh, yeah, I get it. So I just want to get back to the basic idea, though. Because you said this is a somewhat crazy idea. Yes. You, you're, you're, you're trying to essentially play, play a game right. on a real phone. And so you create a contraption that exercises that phone. But if you think about what you've been doing for years, you worked for Google, you built their testing grid. Selenium is kind of a crazy idea as well. Right. It, testing a web app, you could test the code level. Or you could just start up the browser right. and exercise the browser and look at the DOM and run JavaScript. Right. So this is kind of your original idea uh, manifested in a physical machine. Right. So, so the point of Selenium is like it's a very simple API in the sense of what it, what it does at its core. Like open a browser, go to a URL, type text into a field, click buttons. That, that's its essence. 
And you want to do that with software automation because as you have this huge trend in the industry, especially with, you know, with websites, phrases like DevOps, continuous integration, continuous deployment, you have these uh, huge time pressure to, this, to reduce the time from when you commit a line of code to getting it out into production. And so that fundamentally changes the role of QA and testing. When you had years ago, stuff got printed on a CD. It was a one-year cycle, and you could spend a month or two just doing testing. But now that you have like minutes that devs want to go from commit to deployment, the testing cycle has to get automated because that's the only way you can kind of keep up. So you use tools like Selenium to um, to yeah automate that process, mm -hmm. um, and and yeah taking taking that idea uh, to mobile form. So I'd imagine some future version of this, like if you have a mobile app, you might want to have some kind of contraption, especially if you have to test on all the different versions of iPhone and Android, and now you've got all the tablet wars that are out there. You might actually want some kind of contraption for this if you want to be able to deploy something very fast, have a, like a bank of these things. It won't, might not look like this, but there, there is a serious um, productivity win for having a silly robot like this, at least for mobile, for mobile platforms and mobile testing. Everyone needs to do something on the side because it's just gonna it's just gonna fall in place at some yeah. point. Yeah, but I mean, the, the big thing is is speed to market. Like if yeah. you're not going to get if you're not going to get your app out there, someone else uh, is going to be into it. So you you have to get automation to kind of keep that uh, keep going fast. So Sauce Labs, um, my understanding of Sauce Labs is that you sell cloud based testing services. So you could. If you're creating some sort of web app, right. you could pay Sauce Labs money and then you can test on their, on their uh, cloud infrastructure. Right, right. So this kind of came from a project I was working on at Google, the Selenium farm. So um, all of the Google apps were using the Selenium. The thing I've learned, um, and I was on the full-time staff, this team that had this lab that just kept all these machines running specifically for the testing. Right. And so Sauce Labs is kind of like the uh, Google's resources for the rest of us kind of a thing. And so what you do, we've, we've turned this open source software into this cloud compute utility. And a lot of companies, when you have a really important site, like um, you have a lot of users, a lot of revenue, you make your money on your website, you, uh, you need to make sure that you test it. And so what happens is you have a huge lab of all these machines configured to have Internet Explorer and Firefox and Safari and Chrome. And you hire people full time that keeps these labs stocked and updated. And then you have the developers run all these tests on it. But mm -hmm. it's a full time job just keeping it running. Um, and so you ask any big Fortune 500 company, you know, they all have these labs stocked, but it's not their core thing. So the idea with Sauce is to kind of, you know, just use that as a service. Um, and, and one of the cool things, actually, it's kind of like an unsung point that not a lot of people kind of. Uh, um, uh, realize, but a lot of a lot of talk is about cloud computing in general, about like like from the server deployment point of view. Right. But there's some one company um, like uh, Salesforce. They have more machines dedicated to testing than they do to production. So the, the testing aspect of software development is huge, but uh, it doesn't get the headlines as often as it uh, could and should. So if I'm a company and I'm creating a bunch of web apps, I could I could buy a bunch of machines and pay. Uh, whole team of operations people to keep them up and running and update right. all the browsers. Right. Or I can just go to you guys and say, yeah, spin me up an instance of IE6, because exactly. I don't want to install IE6 ever again. Right, right. So yeah, through one lens, uh, yeah, we kind of remove the need to install your own version of VirtualBox or VMware, because you can just use our, use our service. We've got, we have two things, uh, Sauce On Demand, which is the Selenium API driven thing, and we have another thing called Sauce Scout, which you, it's kind of like remote desktop uh, or Skype screen sharing, but instead of controlling a remote machine like your friend's laptop, you're actually controlling our cloud machines, and that's just point and click, no Selenium involved. Uh, yeah, and you have you can get access to an IE6 machine in like 20 seconds. Someone on the Jenkins team tweeted recently that there's some sort of tunneling technology with Rails. Could you just talk about this? It, it sounded pretty space age. Uh, well, we, we have a tunneling service. The thing that we found is a lot of companies will trust the cloud for testing. Mm -hmm. um, because, well, if you're going to deploy your app, your users are outside your firewall as well. Um, yeah, but that's the thing. They haven't moved, a, a lot of these big companies have not yet moved their production app to the cloud, but they will, well, they will uh, trust us as a, as a testing vendor. So we have this firewall between the app they want to test and our service. So we created something called uh, Sauce Connect, and that creates uh, the, the geek... Um, uh, code for that is a reverse SSH tunnel, but mm -hmm. we've made it a lot simpler. You don't have to know the phrases reverse SSH tunnel, but it really is just this magical, uh, I joke that it's, um, my, 
my five minute uh, marketing photoshopping was uh, a picture of a rainbow <laughs> where they've got this cloud service. Basically, it's the connection between your app and, and our cloud service. So wait, because this, this is actually pretty interesting. So you've got, um, you've got companies, big serious companies with firewalls, and, you yeah. know, super serious security people. Yeah. And you have a, some sort of product where you can just run a test. It creates a, it creates a reverse SSH tunnel so that browsers running on your cloud infrastructure mm -hmm can test internal apps. Yes, so the, the, the key magic to that is that it's, a, and then this scares any system administrator out there listening to this, uh, it's they install it locally and then it creates an outbound connection to our cloud and it's a, it's a cloud machine that they can control. They can bring it up and tear it down and they can limit which machines on their local networking can get to. So it can't get to everything, it'll only get to the URLs that you uh, purposely expose. But it has passed muster with the, um, with some really big companies as far as their security team. So they instantly say no, we give them all the information, they're like, okay, yeah, this is good. Well, if they really knew what they were doing, they could probably block the reverse SSH tunnel. Okay. But uh, with SSH, you can do anything. Uh, so the idea with this is that one day, you're gonna have a whole factory full of these things. Right, well actually, and, the, and, yeah. and, and it's And it's just gonna look like that scene in The Matrix when <laughs> Neo walks in and sees all of these people in uh, pods. Right. This, this is essentially, you're looking to create a, a place where people can say, I want to test my iPhone app, and it's actually going to test the real thing. Right. Well, it, it's, not just, it's not just testing, although I think that's the thing that kind of gets it reasonably day job-ish uh, material and not just a weekend project. But there's the, an aspect of it, and actually it's, it's kind of cool in the fact that it's like this erector set or kind of, you know, well, it's Lego compatible, but if I can take this off with just removing these two bolts and I could put on a 3D printer head or I could put on a, um, a drilling, um, a Dremel kind of um, milling tool. And uh, another version of this is to kind of make it a, um, an official version of, there's this project called RepRap. And it's the whole point of that is to make a machine that can make itself. So if I put a drilling, uh, a drilling tool head on this, I could potentially drill my own bit beams. So a machine that can make itself is this thing that's actually popular, I guess, with the kids these days, as they say. Um, so there's a bunch of different things that I could do with this if I take off the head. But my take on this whole 3D printing movement and, and RepRap, um, MakerBot, things like that, is to uh, have my own little device that can play Angry Birds. That's kind of my... Uh, so from this, which can play Angry Birds, to a self-replicating uh, self MakerBot-style machine, to a sentient testing grid that'll take over the world. Yeah, I'll, uh, I don't know, give me a day. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for joining us, and um, good luck. All right, thanks.